Next N. Welcome to Next N, where today I've got a special treat where we've got Rory Kenny from Loudly, CEO and co-founder. Rory, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks, Shane. So uh, extra sleep or more sleep? What is today? I know today is daylight saving. I always forget, is that more or less sleep? I, th I remember it being less sleep, so I'm probably still trying to catch up on sleep, but there's more daylight in the morning. So when you wake up, the sun is shining as opposed to complete darkness. Amen. And where are you coming from right now? I'm based in Berlin, Germany. Okay. Okay. So we're 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 um, two months away from Oktoberfest. <laughs> That's right. We're long past it now. Long past it. Yeah. Well, uh, Rory, today, you know, our goal, right, is we're our, our goal is to get to know you, get to know your story, getting an understanding of like how did you get to where you were uh, as co-founder and CEO of Loudly. But before we get into that, I want to get I want to go back to the roots and try to understand you know, where did you get started and, and how did you find inspiration? So I, I guess, can I just get a little bit of a backstory on you prior to getting into your career? Sure. So without going into a, a long history of myself, so I'm, I'm from Montreal, Canada originally, and I initially was very much a creative person. So I was playing music at a young age. Um, and I took that, took that quite seriously and got myself into a few rock bands and eventually had toured across Canada and the States. I played 200 live shows and also put out, I think, about three or four records as well uh, by the time I was 20, yeah, two years old. So pretty, pretty, uh, pretty busy guy uh, at that young age. Also highly creative and like a lot of output, like, you know, very productive at the time as well. That's my kind of origin story uh, with regards to my early, let's say, career aspirations in Montreal, Canada. Okay. What what kind of rock band were you in? Was it were you doing like originals? Were you doing covers? Like we got some we Neil Diamond. Originals. Just kidding. It's like Neil Diamond covers. Just kidding. <laughs> I actually looking back now, I wish we had done that. No, <laughs> we took ourselves very seriously. Uh, we were. Uh, I think the word would be like. Um, post-punk or art rock would be maybe the kind of genres you may specify or allocate to our attempt to uh to reinvent the rules of music so we were uh we were kind of artsy guys but very loud very rocky music in your face obnoxious uh very squealy but it was great it was, it was a band called mishima uh with some very good friends of mine and we put out a few releases and uh it was a great time to be making music back in the late 1990s in Montreal. It was very much the independent music scene was a big thing at that time. And it was all about, you know, kind of, kind of going against the majors and just trying to do your own business. But it was very difficult because without the benefit of having a major, uh, let's say, label or even like a minor label come after you, uh, you would play all these shows and live the dream, but you wouldn't be getting any record sold. So it was, it was, it was a tough thing to do, but I think there's so many bands at the time where we're all doing the same thing and trying to just... Uh, make great music and just, and just build a following. Fantastic. What, what, like, so can I hear some of your music online today? Can I go to like YouTube and stuff? Go, go check you out. <laughs> <laughs> great question. I mean, there might be a few bootlegged videos available on YouTube. We, we're certainly searchable. I mean, if you do a deep search, you'll find us. Um, I just actually, just the other day, I was talking to my bassist, Liam Maloney, who's based in Montreal, also my best friend. And uh, I was like, Liam, come on, let's get this, let's get, let's get these albums out on Spotify because we've had this plan to do it for a long time, and we're just missing uh, some some cover art. And once we get that done, we'll get it out the door. But besides the fact that I run a business, we're very disorganized when it comes to our band and getting our material out into the real world. So we kind of we 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 were we were we were, we were way before the streaming age. And so um, that transition for for the band was very difficult. That's that's <laughs> awesome. So now, so we'll get there. We'll, I think I think within a couple of months you'll find the music on Spotify, and that'll be a great thing for our our general legacy. What part band. of the band were you? I was the uh, the lead uh, singer and also songwriter and guitarist. Nice. So does that mean everybody at Loudly is like you're singing every holiday party? Every holiday party, <laughs> you've got to put on a show. Have you done it yet? <laughs> I think they don't even know that I was in a band. I think that hasn't been something I talk about too much with the, with the team. Fair. Bizarre. Well, we're going to be tagging every employee in Loudly, and all of them are <laughs> going to know that you now sing. And on your holiday party, there's going to be a request. So after the band, like you, you toured around, you said 300 plus shows, a couple albums. Yeah. 
what did you do? Like, wh when did you make the transition where you're like, hey, I found a calling that was outside of being in a band. I mean, you're still in music. So that calling clearly never left. That was always deep down inside. Music sounds like it was very loudly available for you. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like what? where's where did it spark that it was like maybe i'm gonna try to do something outside of music or not outside of music but outside of a band yeah i mean i think i was, I was i've always been i kind of feel like a bit of an outsider with the mainstream and even even when i was playing music i said i love playing music but i kind of feel like maybe this isn't my my full journey and there's so much more to do you know in the world like traveling and and also you know learning more things and going back to university so um, play music for a while was an amazing experience, but even within that, I felt there were certain limitations uh, that were holding me back from, let's say, realizing myself or or activating my, or manifesting my full potential. So at some point, I also went pretty seriously into the world of TV and film. So again, very much a creative world. Um, and I was also directing and, and writing scripts and making a few little short films, let's say. Um, and also working within the film and TV production uh, industry, which is a bit more of a stable industry in itself. But at some point, I just decided that I wanted to, um, to I, was, I just felt like I was, I was living out this kind of weird struggling artist life, which became a bit of a cliche uh, to myself as well. And, Never heard uh, that in Nashville before. Never. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I became the, the living, walking cliche of a struggling artist. And uh, it just seemed a little bit maybe, yeah, maybe I'll just like, I was, I was making that my own life and it was time to just to, just to look at things a bit differently. Right. And so I decided I wanted to to go into business um, into a bit, let's say, a more mainstream uh, kind of category of work, but bring my creative background into that into that world. And so I decided to do an MBA at Cambridge University in the UK, which I did. And then my yeah, my professional you know life changed dramatically after that point. And then it's like got into sales is what it looked like and then marketing and then CEO. So, so what inspired that route? Cause I know you were at editor intelligence and then you went to orange and uh, France telecom group. It, it, and it seems like that was the transition to get away from Canada, went to school in the UK and then went there. Now you're in Germany. Help me understand how that journey went about. Well, I mean, a lot of things in life are, are just, are, all, are also by accident, right? So yeah. I can't really plan everything. That would just be completely untrue. And if I'm trying to be authentic here, I'll, I'll try to like, to give you some details of, of where the truth matters uh, in the sense of how someone can develop a career, which is, which is not a straightforward path, right? More like a very ziggy zaggy kind of line. So when I came out of my MBA program, which was from a very good school, but moved to London to get a job to start paying off my debt, um, what I realized very quickly after interviewing with quite a few companies is that my, my CV background just didn't make any sense. So I'm coming from a creative background, you know, film and TV, I have an MBA and most companies said, we, we wanted to meet you. It sounds interesting, but we don't know what to do with you. We don't know what, or where to place you in our business. We don't have a role for someone like you. So I immediately was back into the, Oh, I'm again, the outsider trying to, you know, break into something that's kind of different to what I, what I know, understand, or, uh, or I have the skills, but they don't seem to be able to fit me into a very simple slot. So that was uh, the current challenge at that time. Yeah. And like anything, you have to overcome your challenges. You have to just you know do do the best you can at that moment. So I eventually um, got picked up by a startup uh, to do a bit of consulting into their uh, into what they were trying to do with the strategy, and they were they were effectively like a um, they were collecting intelligence uh, from the internet about the fast moving, uh, you know, VC partnerships and also startup sector, which I thought was really cool. Uh, although that was never my intention to do that, but I joined the company because I had no choice. I had to make some money. Uh, the terms to be very nice guys at a great time. But after a one month, they said, well, listen, this consulting gig is over. So uh, we have a sales position available to you. So you can take that or you can like walk out the door and leave. So again, I had no choice. And this was shocking to me because I never saw myself as a salesperson. I always had a bad connotation word especially back, I think, uh, in the, let's say, early 2000s. Um, but I, I said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so I started to do sales. I learned it just from, from nothing. Um, and I quickly became like, yeah, the best salesperson they, ever, they had. And then I eventually became the head of sales and hired a sales team. So that was a weird path. It was, it was very difficult for me, to be honest, if I'm being truthful, to switch from being a kind of a creative, analytical, strategic person to being 
very much on the phone, uh, more you know, person to person on a selling selling mode, and also the fact that the chase after numbers and chase after your, your sales targets, and then uh, that was all very new. And so that was a big identity shift, to be honest. But um, sometimes the things that you're forced to do become the most important things you need in your career. So actually, what what I learned from that experience was that I had that I learned how to sell a product, learned how to how to sell myself, learned how to articulate things in a specific way to people to understand. And I wouldn't have had that that uh, that experience if I hadn't been forced to do it. I would have never mm-hmm. chosen to do that. But actually being forced to do it was maybe the best thing for my career. I've always said that I believe that everybody should be forced to do sales yes. at least once in their life, somewhere, like somehow. It's just like, just go on the front lines and f- see what it's like. Like if you're an engineer, you're a product manager, you're an analyst, you're doesn't matter, customer service, like speak to the customers and see what see what objections they have and can you handle those objections this is like a, a, in my opinion it could be one of the most valuable things that anybody does uh, e- e- even in the recruiting world obviously i'm i'm some people try to say recruiting isn't sales i will disagree with them 10 out of 10 times but when you were doing that like clearly you were successful right like it eventually led you to the path of starting your own business becoming the ceo multiple promotions throughout your career what do you think differentiated you, even though you had no sales experience when you got started, you as somebody that was able to get promoted and to be seen and, and raised up through others versus some of the peers that you had alongside you? And honestly, I, I assume some of them probably had more experience than you, um, you, you know, sitting next next to you. Yeah, I mean, it's a tricky question because I think some, some salespeople are very good at what they do, but they're they're locked into just being salespeople for their whole career, yeah. which which can be great, but it can also be quite hard, right? Because at some point, you feel like you're just being um, perceived as a number you bring in every month, and that could be quite hard on, on anyone. Right? I mean, that's a, that's a hard thing to do on a monthly basis and stay at a high performance level. Um, I would say that my educational background and my also my hunger curiosity for market sectors and my own my own due diligence and my own initiative research uh, set me apart from other salespeople who are uh, let's say less uh, inclined to analyze markets. So I think if you're going to be in sales and and you want to be very successful, then it's all about the extra work you do to understand your customer more, to know the market. I mean, you have to really do additional work. I think to do very well in sales. So I would always do uh, an additional three hours or five hours a week. And I found that if I did that additional five hours, so that I did like more like a 45 or 50 hour a week. And those additional hours I put in made a, made a huge difference to my sales targets or it got me over the line or got me to exceed sales targets. So my commission was actually based on the additional, on the additional work. So that's one thing. But secondly, like I said before, I think, um, be more analytical, help me to have an edge. And that helped me to raise myself to a level where it wasn't about sales. It was actually about business development, which I think are two different things. So business development is where you, you learn from the market and then you can come back into the business and explain it to, you know, at that time, the CEO founder, but also to the, the tech people in our business and say, listen, if we were to build this product a bit differently, we could then serve this market or this need or make this additional revenue. So moving from sales more towards a business development perspective is what set me apart. That's also what drove me much further in my career as well. So let me ask you this. So there's a lot of different people that I talk to. It, they could be in sales. They could be in engineering. They could be in product management. And I think that there's there's this common thread of, but my business isn't giving us the right training or the business isn't coaching us on this thing enough or they're not giving me enough learning tools and i've always had this conversation with a lot of different people where there's always these like peripheral things internally or externally um, that become roadblocks so for you did you rely on your employer to be the one that was exclusively doing the training or when you're talking about your three to five hours of extra learning and market research was was that something that you did independently and like you went out and you sought after information on your own or did you rely on the business to give you that information well i think fundamentally uh i'll say i'll say two things one one i'm just i was born as a very intrinsically independent person my personality is just to do kind of do whatever i want that's always been my, my <laughs> mantra that's why you're in a rock band <laughs> uh, that, that, yeah, possibly, but that can get you to trouble but it also paves the way for being 
extremely like taking self ownership of, of everything in your life, right? From your career to hitting targets, whatever it is. And, um, I, th and I'll say this right now, the moment that you rely upon your company or your boss or your colleagues to improve your situation is the day that you give up ownership of your career and the ownership and you give up your ability to get ahead uh, because you're basically relying upon other people to do it for you, which is which is the worst thing to do. So no one ever told me to do anything in, in, in any one of my jobs. I had to figure everything out myself. And if you know how to get ahead in life and get ahead in your career, it's always to, to be extremely proactive. And just you could also do things that are wrong and make mistakes. But the fact that you're putting in five, six, seven or 10 hours extra per week on your own initiative means you're going to be learning something along the way. And chances are, if the rest of the team is not doing that, then uh, you have a very high chance of exceeding your team and doing much better. I'm not saying to be competitive with them, but in all honesty, it's a competitive race out there to get ahead, right? So if you want to get ahead, you got to be competitive. What does competitive mean? Well, putting extra hours. What does extra hours mean? Well, learning what to do in those extra hours and, and making mistakes and, and just being very proactive. And also, I think in today's market, uh, the big emphasis really is about self-learning. So if you can self-learn things and figure things out for yourself, that goes a long way. And it's also, it gets noticed. People will say, this person did this on their own initiative, on their own volition. They figured it out. I didn't have to coach them through it. And uh, if anything, managers love that about certain kinds of employees. Yeah, and, and likely a reason why you were able to surpass your peers, why you were able to elevate and get promoted was because you took initiative and you drove your own success without others relying on others. Now, the same question could go into, it's like, okay, Rory, like, yeah, I totally want to go learn things on my own. How do you differentiate? Because like, when I think about continuous learning, continuous learning is, can be challenging for some people because things are constantly changing. Things are constantly moving again, whether it's in sales, whether it's in software engineering product, things are moving all the time, whether that's technologies or consumer behaviors, right? So how do you decide what strategies and habits that you've been able to build to be able to make sure that you're adopting the right information to get ahead of the curve? That, and, and what kind of advice would you give somebody when they're trying to self-educate and self-learn? Because there's some people that their biggest fear is, like, well, what if I invest in the wrong stuff or read the wrong things or invest in the, the the wrong areas how do you how do you build habits and then strategies to make sure that you're investing in the right stuff yeah i mean i think today there's a lot more information available especially through youtube which is a great self-learning tool and, and and maybe the maybe youtube is what propels self-learning to the whole next level globally which it has already um i think there's no wasted energy or time whenever you do research uh, that is self-initiated because um, once you go down that rabbit hole you're going to start learning things anyway so whether you come across a podcast or a video uh, tutorial or whether it's um, some literature um, you're going to find a reference and they'll be like oh I, I read this paragraph and it says something about this other thing and what is that other thing all about and then you can go look at that and learn about that pretty quickly and you don't need to learn things necessarily so deeply like it's not about in-depth learning all the way to becoming an expert it's learning enough to give you that edge or to give you that broad understanding of maybe where the trends are moving or how to connect the dots the connecting dots is not an easy, easy thing to do and it's um it's it's also widely perceived as maybe the most advantageous uh skill set is how do you connect the dots in your organization connect the dots between customers what they're saying and then and then analyze that and bring that into something that could be a new product or a new way to sell or a new channel. And uh, those unobvious things uh, don't just happen with a strategy of learning, but actually just happen just by actively going and just and starting it. So the moment you say, what if I don't do this? What if I get the wrong one? Uh, you're, you're kind of what we call, you know, you're, you're in a moment of paralysis. And I've, we've all faced, I faced it too. I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? This is totally the wrong path and I should just stop. But um, the best thing to do when you're in that paralysis mode is just to stop thinking about it and just to start reading something or learning something or watching that video or, or, or listening to that podcast because it will take you to another area that maybe you hadn't thought about. And you just have to trust your instincts. You know, At some point, you have to have some kind of self-belief. Uh, very important, have self-belief that maybe uh, what you're doing isn't the wrong thing and that it may lead somewhere uh, that you didn't know you were going to expect it, but actually will reveal something that's very positive for you.
Yeah, I think that the idea of failing forward constantly and continuously can be a unique advantage. And that could be in your learning habits where you're like, I maybe I'm reading the stuff that isn't going to directly benefit me. But I don't know about you, Rory, but like I've been in multiple, you know, scenarios where I'm like trying to learn about marketing or I'm trying to learn about product or I'm I'm trying to learn about customer service or I'm trying to learn about marketing and learning something that isn't necessarily directly what I'm doing can indirectly give me key insights that allow me to understand the full picture and, and, and have a different perspective. And so sometimes learning stuff adjacent to what I do um, ends up adding more value and creating these weird aha moments where it's like, oh, now I understand why that was a problem or, oh, now I understand why that customer wanted this thing or, oh, now I understand why my teammate was really struggling at communicating this topic with me. And that allows me that full circle, be able to deliver on my own results at a higher capacity and in a, in a faster frequ frequency at times. Yeah, I, mean, I, I can say that when I moved onto, let's say working at TripAdvisor, which is a very big, you know, American tech company, um, what they, they had a very good culture and it was called the T-shaped, let's say ambition of an employee, which was that, you, it was good to be very specialized. Like then that's where you really deliver a, a strong amount of value to a very specific area, which is very important for big companies. Um, but what they really wanted to do, and they and this was a framework, was that you should eventually become a bit more T-shaped so that you can be specialized, but then you should be able to go more horizontally across the organization. Because once you can go across the organization, you can kind of cross-pollinate concepts and communicate more effectively. And you can a network better. You can make more connections. You can connect those dots a little bit easier. You can find solutions that are more practical and more achievable. And um, in that sense, you become a bit more generalist. So, like you just said, you know, once you go down one path of learning and you find about something else. Um, so, like if you're not in marketing, right? But you learn about marketing, then when you go into a meeting with marketing people. You, you can have empathy for what they're talking about and not um, dismiss it, for example. So once you dismiss something, you can assure yourself that you're no longer not going to have that good professional network with the marketing team, which means that you're going to be stonewalled from maybe knowing the CMO very well. But if you understand marketing and you can empathize with what they're saying, you could potentially help them uh, achieve some of their goals, which helps you achieve your goals. You get visibility. You're seen as someone who's good to work with, who can communicate nicely across the organization. You can also uh, embody the culture of the organization, which is to be collaborative and to be across uh, different products and different scopes. And all this helps you, again, to raise your profile within your team, but also with, for your boss, but also for other teams, other bosses who get to notice you. And this is always helpful in a, um, I'd say, in a medium size or, or but of course the big organizations you always want to uh, to pop out somehow and and uh, i think learning about different uh teams is important i mean marketing yeah. is a very broad subject i mean it goes from analytics paid marketing seo consumer brand marketing design i mean there's a lot of touch points and it's all fascinating and the last thing you have to also you have to assume that it's all quite interesting stuff and even though the person who's doing analytics may not be the same kind of personality as you, they have a skill set that is probably quite extraordinary and that you can certainly learn a little bit about and take away a little bit from them to use that for your own product development or for your own sales strategy. This is all very helpful to people across different teams. Yeah. And so one of the, the other things that I always like to ask people is just like, for me, I know that along the way and along my journey, because uh, Next Level is the fifth company that I've started. And, you know, being a co-founder, I have to imagine there was like a key figure or a set of key figures or a set of influential mentors throughout your career that were role models that helped you get to where you are today. And they were individuals that helped shape your leadership style. So I guess from your perspective, who's like a mentor or a role model or a series of role models that you've had that have kind of like helped shape the trajectory of where you're at today and how that's influenced your leadership philosophy over at Loudly? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, um, I don't think we perceive ourselves as leaders until there's a point where you have to take leadership and Leadership is uh, it's a pretty heavy word for good reason, because you start to have a responsibility and an ownership of a result. So I, I wouldn't say that I had any kind of uh, leadership 
uh, responsibilities until actually when I became the leader of a sales team at that startup. And I, actually, it was too early for me. I, I, I was not prepared to be a leader at that time. I was still just actually just enjoying doing really well, making good money as a sales guy, and also enjoying going out and having a good time on the weekend. But that part of my life, I was not ready to be a leader. So it's also, I think, about being ready to be a leader or seeing yourself as a leader at some point. Um, when it comes to having mentors, I can, I can certainly say that I've been very fortunate that in my life, I've had many very good role models and very, and also a lot of different kinds of mentors that I've come across. I, I was never looking for mentors, but they, when they, when they appeared, it's quite obvious that this person had um, would have a big impact, let's say, on me, or that I found what they were saying or how they embody their own, um, you know, perspective is, is quite powerful. So I can give a few examples. So one example, which I think is a very strange one, is uh, I had a theater teacher in college who was um, very unconventional. So while it was labeled a theater class, we, did, we, did, we didn't do any theater productions. He just made us do yoga uh, for two hours, twice a week. Uh, and he would play Philip Glass music in the background. And the reason for the yoga was just to strengthen our body. So he's like, if you can't have a strong body and you can't move your body correctly and you have no control over your body, how can you ever become an actor? I was like, well, interesting. And um, you know, if you can't understand music and rhythm, how can you ever uh, learn how to use your body in, that, in this special way? So actually, this this class became just about something else and not about acting. And the teacher was so strong and so he was so rude to us in some ways and so mean to us. <laughs> but it, in Canada at that time, uh, it's a pretty soft culture, right? And so having a teacher who would kind of a little, just basically push you a little bit and very and very much do it in your face. I found was quite compelling. It's quite refreshing of someone to really push you to your limits. And the limits of that time was not intellectual. It was just purely like, just make your body work, you know, at that time. And I was, I was around 18 years old. So what that person taught me was that um, you can push yourself to extraordinary limits. I became very strong throughout that year, just from doing what he taught me to do and, um, and to do things differently and, and, and just accept uh, a different path as well and be open-minded to a different way of developing yourself and to manifesting, you know, what you can become in your potential. So this person was very much into making his, 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 uh, his, his uh, students realize their potential to get over their fears, to overcome themselves, to try new things, take risks. And that's something that actually at, you know, at the age of 18, you know, we were not exposed to that kind of, uh, yeah. that kind of character, you know, so much in our lives. It was all, everyone was kind of always making you try to try to make you feel good your whole life. Yeah. So and that's like one of those different. fundamental principles where it was like, I'm going to challenge you to think about like, yes, you want to be an actor, but there are all these other things that influence whether or not you can actually be an actor. And let's think about what some of those things are. And in a way I can almost even imagine that being like, Hey, I was a salesperson but there are things that are preventing me from being a top tier salesperson. What are those other things? And that's where you had like this analytical brain. You were doing additional research. You you were controlling your own fate because you had it. Uh, fundamental principles that were instilled in you early on that were like there are things that are that you can control that will influence the direction of your acting career. There are things in your control that can influence the direction of your sales career. There are things that are in control that could you know, allow you to be a good CEO that can help you build a product, but like control what you can control. And you, let's start with your body. Let's start with this thing, this fundamental thing. And that that's really inspiring. And that's kind of awesome that he was just like, I know this is an acting class. Let's control what you can control. And this is something that can influence your future. And it's like, oh, shoot, that's not even the first that that's not even the first thing that comes to mind in my head. I'm like, that's so punk. Like that's awesome. Yeah, it was. It was. It was not reading memorize one line the whole time. It was just about working with body make <laughs> strong. I think I think what he distilled was was again a sense of um, you know, just to believe in yourself. And you know, sometimes you learn things along the way from mentors. It's not intellectual academics, just about self-belief and about how taking risks with your own um with your own decisions that yes, you may fail, but the benefit is that you could also really win out if you make that risk. And Taking that risk, I think, has to come from a place of self-belief first and foremost. And it's hard to learn self-belief. Some people have, some people don't. But it's something that everyone can work on. And I think coming across mentors that teach you how to have that self-belief is quite valuable, especially early on in your life, right? 
I genuinely believe that self-belief is a muscle. Being happy is a muscle. Being, uh, having like this winning is a mindset, like positive attitude is a muscle. Having future scope and belief that your career is going to be awesome or that you're going to get promoted or all of those things are a muscle that you have to train yourself every single day. And I, I totally, totally believe in that. So I want to dive into like loudly. Let's get into that. Like what inspired you to start loudly? And let's talk about what does loudly do? Sure. So loudly is an AI music creation platform um, that allows people to create, customize and discover music using AI. Uh, it's totally revolutionary. You can generate the most amazing sounding techno or house or trap or EDM tracks in a space of a few seconds by clicking a few buttons. You can also personalize your song by putting in unique parameters like uh, tempo and instrumentation that you want, uh, putting some effects as well to make it really sound like your own. And this is really um, all part of the AI revolution. And one of the reasons why I'm doing this is because even though I'm a musician, I can make music, there are you know, 90% of the people out there cannot make music and it's really hard. Actually making music is a very hard thing to do and it requires more than 10,000 hours of, uh, of effort to do so. And even if you put in 10,000 hours, you can still end up making pretty bad music. So, um, but I will say that the the experience of making music and being creative in the musical realm is, is extremely positive and fun. And since everyone's a music fan, everyone knows that something about music is fun and it's a, it's a really enriching experience. So what this um, allows you to do, so what Loudly can help people do is actually get right into touch with that musical creational experience, but without all the crazy 10,000 hours of effort to do so. So you get to feel the experience of making music without having to learn laboriously how to do it, which is very difficult. There's also a lot of technical challenges uh, with making music today, like using online software or you know whatever, even getting a microphone to work can be quite difficult. But with Loudly, um, it's all web-based. You just press a few buttons. So anyone can really make music now. And uh, it can happen globally from Tokyo to, to Rio. And it just requires a web interface. And that's how easy it is today to make music. And what do you believe long-term that truly unlocks? I think the, I mean, the most important thing I think about here is, again, tapping into um, the amount of people in the world who want to experience making music and trying it out, but never could before. And um, so as a kind of a, let's say a mission goal, the mission is to really, you know, lift the world's musical creativity. So if, if let's say 10% of the people in the world right now are able to touch musical software, or make music, uh, we hope to make that happen for, you know, 90% of the people in the world should now be able to make music and say, yeah, I've, I had that experience. It was fun. It was interesting. So I think we're spreading the democratization, like the true democratization of music creation is now possible through AI. Uh, we are one of a few companies doing it, but I hope that we can touch a majority of the people who will eventually use AI and music creation software. Um, secondly, another big thing in unlocks right now is that uh, if you want to be on Spotify, for example, uh, you have to be, again, a musician and put a lot of hours into making music. But with Loudly, you can soon, very soon, uh, start to make music, make it a bit more unique. You can create your own virtual artist profile. You can create your own uh, background story using AI and then release that music directly onto SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple, et cetera. And uh, also have the experience of becoming kind of like a public music persona. And that's also now, you know, will become widely democratized. Anybody who wants to have that experience, which I think is also fun. So it's part of the whole like, you know, kind of a virtual persona program where you have virtual personas across different platforms, uh, across gaming, across social media, and it lends itself towards that trend. Yeah. And, and and I and I think that there are a lot of people in the world that just want to create stuff with their friends. And like music is one of those things that is such a fun experience to be able to share and to be able to to trade with with friends at the end of the day. I, I look at it very similar where there's, you know, there's obviously for and against uh, using AIs in a, in a lot of mediums like art. Right. So that there are these generative AI art fundamentals like a mid journey, for example. I love Mid Journey. I, I also, you know, at one point in time, I had a full ride art scholarship. I thought I was going to go to school to be an artist and go into an animation studio, and that life ultimately wasn't for me. But like, I like to be able to do and doodle and to make things. But at the end of the day, that could be really, really time consuming. But if I can sort of have what I sort of like, and then spin that up into something that can 
abstract that thing and create a hundred versions of it. And I can use that across a lot of the other things that I do in my life. I can enjoy it at a faster scale. And for me, my I, I don't get five to 10 hours a day to do creation in that way. Like that investment just doesn't exist. And I also imagine it for like the everyday person like me, where it's like I'm using mid journey to create these fun experiences for myself that I get to use with my friends and my family. And I get to create these fun abstract things that I could, you know, put on a cup and send it over to my family for uh, Christmas. I, I wouldn't be able to do that without having a mid journey thing that could augment my time. Yeah. I mean, I think there's also a massive um, area around being, you know, maybe, let's say more productive or reducing the time to do things that are just fun. And like you said, I mean, most people don't have the time to spend five hours creating a new design for a coffee cup for Christmas or for a birthday for, for a family they want to do it anyway. And that's all become possible now. So one example I can give is that, you know, people think it's, it's only for amateurs, but actually even highly skilled designers, uh, also an example in house. So we have a highly skilled designer in house uh, who's also now using mid journey to create us a lot of artwork because I said, Hey Jake, um, unfortunately I need to have a hundred original you know, cover art tiles for these songs. And I've never asked that before because I just knew that if I did, he would just do that for a year and it would take forever. But now with mid journey, uh, for example, um, so what's beautiful about what, what he knows because of his deep skill set as a designer, he can write the most sophisticated, sophisticated prompts, which only a really a designer could do and then get some beautiful imagery coming out of mid journey and also scale that rapidly across, I get a hundred uh, different song art covers. And that's not possible. It was not possible last year, but it's pretty much possible now. And that leap of productivity for us is huge. I mean, just for our business, that's really big. But again, on an individual level, like I said before, um, I had to also kind of stop playing music because I just could not invest the time into it. I can't, I couldn't do my sales job and do music. I just couldn't do it all together. It's impossible. So, but now that I can click a few buttons uh, within, you know, really a couple of seconds and make it really cool music, I can still tap into that feeling, that experience. I can still get the quality I want to hear. Uh, and I can do it all so easily now within one simple platform. So I think it's, it's, um, it's basically the music or the creation experience with, this, with pretty high quality results, but at a fraction of the effort and a fraction of the time because we're all busy people. And I'm not trying to dismiss the creative endeavor. I think it's important that we all remain creative. And, and, and I'm pretty much guaranteeing everyone that we will remain very creative no matter what. But uh, having the option to be creative very quickly is of great value to many uh, influencers, video creators, music creators, producers, uh, professional you know, clients, um, freelancers that do it for a living. This is just a, a, a massive productivity boost for a lot of people. Well, and in general, if like if you use it to augment your time, there it's like some of it's li limitless. It's 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 awesome. Like I'm writing a book right now, and there are times where I just get writer's block, and it's probably no different than a musician using your platform, where it's just like I just have a block, and I just need to hear like 50 variants, and then maybe 10 of those variants happen to have something that inspire me, creates a spark, and it's like I can take. I get Picasso. I, I, I love the idea of Picasso theory where a great artist don't copy, they steal, right? Where they can take different methodologies, different painting strokes, different variants, and they can blend those things together. And using AI, your tool, to be able to blend different variants of music, and then you could have 50 outputs and you could choose 10 that you steal a couple of things from to really curate something that's like special, ends up being very, very valuable. Because at the end of the day, nobody's truly creating anything that's truly original. It's all inspired from something somewhere at some time. It's just your job to put those things in an order that becomes unique. And you're the representation of that thing that already pre-existed. You're just creating a new variant of it. At this point, everything's a new variant of something, right? Well, I think that's, um, that's absolutely true in the sense that the variant is a big part of what AI does really well. And um, this leads to another kind of view that I have around the AI, let's say revolution taking place that we're moving from, we're kind of transi transiting from being a, a world of kind of creators, but to curators, right? So 
before you'd have to create that essay or create that piece of marketing copy or create that sales pitch. But today you can kind of get AIs to do that for you in different variation, different variant forms. And so what the onus is now back on the individual is to be a very good curator. So you say, well, I got you know three different versions of the sales pitch from ChatGPT, so, but I need to choose one that's gonna work. So you can just choose one and then you have to probably slightly edit it to make it really quite perfect. It's like, so how it's do you put more... it in your own voice, right? Like how do I put my stamp yeah. as the architect saying, this is the variant I'm choosing, but then how do I make that uniquely me? How do I identify with that and put my essence or my DNA into that copy? Yeah, that's very important. Otherwise, it'll all be the same everywhere. So that'll be no, no use at all. Yeah. Yep. So let me ask you this. So obviously, like, you know, Loudly is growing. Loudly is hiring. It's just like in your role, I'm assuming you're somewhere deeply involved in the hiring process and you're involved somewhere in the decision making on who should come on and who should not. Right. And there's always this age old battle of like, how do you strike the difference between hiring somebody for culture fit and potential versus hiring for somebody that's deeply technical and their area of expertise? Um, because those always are the things that we're balancing. It's just like technical aptitude, whether it's marketing, product, sales, doesn't matter. Technical aptitude versus culture fit and, and potential. How do you guys balance that? And, and what is your perspective on it? Yeah, sure. I mean, I've hired a lot of people, you know, in my career here. So over the past, let's say, yeah, four years, I've hired maybe maybe 15, 20 people at times. And I've had to let people go as well. And people have also left the business. So I've, I've come across quite a few different people and scenarios. Um, I think there's, it's, if you have, if you have a one size fit all strategy, like the, whichever one that is, there'll always be sort of a water leaking situation where it doesn't always work out perfectly. So the question is definitely is around balance. Um, one thing that we do here, which I think is fundamental is that we make sure we have kind of like a technical test, right? So if someone has hard skills such as coding, then we have to make sure that they can pass a certain level of coding ability, right? And then they do a test and then we share that test with the developer team and the team makes an assessment based on that coding ability. That is like first and foremost, maybe the most important thing. And then if that goes well, we then uh, do a few more interviews, which is more about, uh, again, like the mentality, the perspective, the potential to collaborate, the, the, the ability to communicate effectively within the team. So then it's really more about, about team fit. Um, if the person can do something extraordinary technically, but the team fit is obviously not going to work, then nine times out of 10, we're going to say we can't hire that person because if we hire that person, then I'm going to make my team unhappy and then my team will, will just become less effective and less productive and then they're going to all quit. So it's really a delicate thing here to hire someone into it. And, you know, you, you do get it wrong. You know, once in a while, I'll get it wrong. Um, but in general, the team fit is very important, but only if they can get the bare technical, uh, you know, get past the technical test. For other kinds of roles where you cannot do a test, then it's even more difficult. So then it's really just about, you know, I have to really pry into someone's background to give examples that are that make sense to me. So give me examples of what you've done and make it make sense. Like, don't give me buzzwords. I want to understand exactly what you did. Then I want, to, I want to make sure that that person actually did what they said, because sometimes you can just give an example of something that your team did, but that you didn't contribute into. So at that point, I will then use a line of questions to really figure out what they did specifically and why. So then what I tend to do with um, software skill hirees is really, I really go more into their thought process. Like, how do they think? You know, how do they ask questions? Why do they do this and do that? Because like then you learn about how they approach their their job, their career, uh, their professional life, and their specific, let's say, skill. And it's kind of like what I did in my time. And I think it's important that if some, I'm going to hire someone. I want to know that they can also explain themselves. Because typically, if you can explain what you did and and the results you achieved, and it's it's um, and it makes sense, then you can maybe replicate that as well in our business. Um, and it's almost like, can you show me your work? So it's just like, give me an example yeah. and let's break it down. And it's kind of that day old, like, show me your math. Like, how did you get from point A to point B and break it down as small as you can 
And then that was like, oh, okay, if they could go deep into detail around something, then they were clearly deeply involved. If it's surface level and it's just high level and they, they don't remember it, it's been so long, they don't remember. I remember thing, things in high school like it was yesterday. It's like, but if they don't remember how, then it's like, okay, you weren't that involved. Yeah, I think it's, it's something you learn along the way being um, kind of like a team manager or leader that you can't always teach people how to how to achieve a positive result because sometimes whatever the market didn't work or other reasons. But what you can teach into your team is, is, is kind of like, what is your thought process? Like, how does this company think about things and how do we make decisions based on what kind of evidence or how did you articulate this so that we can make decisions as a team? And I'll give an example. Like I, I learned this very rigorously from uh, the CEO and uh, co-founder of TripAdvisor, Steve Coffer, who was also another kind of mentor to me. And um, when I had to bring forward a proposal for a very big partnership, for example, and it had many different you know aspects. It had a branding aspect, it had a media aspect, it had a, a budget aspect, it had a, um, a business forecast aspect. It had many different. It had technical integration costs and aspects and, and trade offs. It was a very. Those were complicated deals. And we had to get sign off on these deals. And so, you know, what he demanded from, from his, from the whole company, but also including myself was like, give me your exact thought process on this proposal. Like, what is it? Why are we doing it? Why is it important now? Uh, why don't we just do something else instead? Um, you know, is this technically feasible? Have you gone to talk to the right people in the company to prove this, that it is feasible? And I have to write a very long, you know, proposal and, and articulate it very carefully and the risk was if I didn't articulate that carefully, he could just dismiss it and the deal would never happen. So I had to put a lot of time into that. And I kind of expect that from people um, in my team and from people who apply to the company. It's like, you need to be able to explain yourself uh, because if you can, then it shows everyone around you, including your new team members, that you A, understand your job, you can explain your job, you can explain your process to achieve results. You can explain why you want to bring on more resource, more other people to help you achieve that goal. And then you explain the potential outcomes of your project, whether it could be a medium, high, low success rate. But if someone can do that, then I get a lot of confidence in, in their process and their journey, and I'm willing to go along their journey with them. But if they can't explain these things, then, then for me, it's just alarm bells that, then I had no idea what they're going to do. I don't know what they're going to work on. I'm not sure how they're going to work on it. And I'm not sure if they understand that um, that there are low, medium, high risks to whatever they're going to do. And they won't be able to understand that or gauge it. So I won't know how to invest into that resource. So it's tricky, but I look for people who are able to articulate. And then secondly, people who are, what I would say the most important thing for me sometimes is like, show me that you have initiative, that you can just go do your work without me having to tell you what to do next. Like it's important, especially in startups where there's not a lot of time always to explain everything to the, from end to end. And so what I prefer are people who have, again, this initiative, uh, proactive, um, just go start doing it and then let us know how it's going. Tell us why you're doing it, explain what you think is going to come, but just go do it. And don't wait for people to tell you how to do things because nobody wants to do that. Everyone's got their own thing they're working on and they collaborate by the collaborating on things that are communal. But because um, I, I can't, it's very hard to, it's, it's easy to inspire someone for a few months, but over a course of two years or three years, I want to be actually, to be honest, I want to be inspired by them. I'm, I'm hiring people where I'm like, they inspire me. And I find that much more comfortable because because then it means that someone who's um, who's very capable, who has initiative, getting results done, collaborating, and I'm getting inspired by their ability to just deliver and to be successful. So I'm actually looking for something almost opposite to um, to what people think in that way. Yeah, you're like I want to be inspired from the bottom up rather Absolutely. than needing to always easier, inspire from the top. Easier down. to run the business if uh, if people who come into it are self inspired. It's way yep. easier. You're like, I just need to find every single person that was in that acting class that learned yeah. the same thing that I did right. <laughs> and they could control what they could control in every aspect of their life and throw, throw them into the weeds. So, well, Rory, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today and to, you know, share your story uh, with everyone that's listening today, the, the millions of people that are probably listening to this <laughs> today. How can like, so I, I guess, let me ask you this, like, what are you hiring for today? 
How can people get a hold of you? Um, yeah. Yeah, right now we're hiring for a backend engineer. Um, so this person should be, let's say we're calling a mid-level position. Uh, we're coming into a very exciting phase of our company and there's a lot to work on. Um, we can, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can reach out via jobs at lally.com. Uh, ideally we're hiring someone who's based in Germany or in Poland where we have two of our employment jurisdictions and we can legally pay you properly. Um, having said that, we're looking for people who are attached to music. I think it's always helpful because I think culturally, uh, people are more invested if they like the music industry or category. And then someone, again, who's looking to be very collaborative uh, and to self-learn. You got to learn that code base and uh, no one's going to like walk you through it. So someone who's highly self-motivated would be great. And of course, there's a huge opportunity to learn and become much more senior uh, over the course of a few years in the process. We have great engineers here in the business. Awesome. So if you're in love with music, if you're a back-end engineer in Germany or Poland, hit Rory up, go yep. to the website, uh, comment some below if you know somebody, tag them, whatever. Uh, but appreciate everybody listening and appreciate uh, you joining us, Rory. Thanks so much, Shane. Great to be here. Next day.